Hi everyone, welcome back to pre-modern world history. Um, today, week three, I'm giving you lecture one. Uh, so this would be the lecture from the 17th uh, on Tuesday. And today I'm going to talk about the early Americas, prehistoric America, uh, especially from the Neolithic into uh, basically Incan civilization, roughly that span of time, which is a huge chunk, about 8,000 to 10,000 years of civilization. The uh, Paleolithic will also be something we talk about just a little bit today. But before we get started, I wanna talk about your discussions that you're going to be leading. So you are leading a discussion starting here on Thursday on the 19th, uh, your discussion group, Signups are in our shared Google folder. You can see them there. So this is the group of people who are leading the discussion from class number one so far. Uh, and I'm gonna move myself here. And from class two, uh, we only have three of you signed up so far. And I might throw in a question as well, which uh, I'll have here on the slides actually. Um, if no one else asks a similar question, I might throw that question in too. What you can do when you go to Blackboard, go ahead and sign in. You'll see our discussion board and you can click that. It's under discussions here on the left. And the one that you'll be typing in this week or, or writing in this week is student-led discussion number one, comparing early societies. And each class, each of the two classes will have a separate discussion because that's the way Blackboard is set up. But I might find a way to share uh, some of the materials. Perhaps in lecture next week, I'll go over some of the answers uh, that are particularly, you know, important or that kind of point us forward in the course. I'll probably just pick one or two here or there to talk about if something is really pertinent to the next lecture. Um, some weeks I won't do that. Some weeks I will. Um, okay, but if you have any questions about the discussion, please let me know. If you uh, aren't signed up yet for two discussions, you need to go ahead and do that. And I've gotten a couple emails about that, uh, and I'm getting you all signed up on that list. I, I will put you on that list if you've emailed me. Okay, so today, the Americas in focus. We're going to be looking at the human migration into the Americas to start out, and also quite a bit at both Mesoamerica and uh, early pre-Incan uh, civilization in South America. Uh, so to start with this set of pictures I have here, these are variants in different spearheads that are often found, especially in North America in large quantities all over North America. Um, and in particular around the Appalachian mountain range, there are tons of them found there. Tens of thousands of these things have been found. And in general, as a catch all term, and as you can see, there are lots of names for lots of different uh, spear points here. The Clovis uh, spear point is the granddaddy of these spear points. I'm going to go ahead and get my face out of the way here. Um, and what we're going to talk about here to start out with is something called Clovis culture. You can look at some of these links if you'd like. Some of these spear points are found in New York, in the state of New York. Um, and here's a map to start out uh, of all of the fluted spear points, this is called fluting when you make these uh, indents in these chipped stones on each side so that a piece of wood or other uh, spear pole material in, in some parts of the world, you might use bamboo or something, uh, will hold that spear point in place. You can then wrap around the wood and hold the spear there. And these spears would be used to down large land mammals and also for the Inuit, uh, large sea mammals. And we'll get to them just very briefly. We'll talk about the Inuit towards the end of the lecture today. So all of these dots are all of the uh, finds of Clovis points or related fluted points across uh, North America. As you can see, really, really dense in the east, but also quite a few are found out in the west, including in places like Arizona, New Mexico, California, Oregon, Washington, uh, more Washington than Oregon, um, and up into Canada. Okay, uh, so why are Clovis points important? Uh, they're important for several reasons, you know, first and most obvious being that they are evidence of human habitation of the Americas and evidence of the technology that people were using in the Americas from roughly around 13,000 uh, 
BCE to uh, you know much much later, but it's that start starting date, that starting point in Clovis uh, culture that seems to be particularly important. Um, this chart I have here for the Stone Age. First, it's to remind you of these ages in general that there's an old Stone Age and a new Stone Age, but also to point out that uh, and archaeologists and anthropologists will also sometimes talk about a brief transitional period called the Mesolithic or the Middle Stone Age, which we didn't really talk about before. And this is important because uh, things like Clovis points may be a sign of a Mesolithic period that may be somewhat extended in the Americas, especially in North America, um, and which, you know, is, is still a period in which hunting and gathering, as you can see, hunting and gathering are still going on. Maybe food is stored at some points and sometimes, but people aren't really farming yet, as you see over here on the right under Neolithic. So Neolithic is associated with farming, Paleolithic is pure hunting and gathering, and then Mesolithic might be a period in which people hunted, but then also stored some food away. They weren't living purely hand to mouth. And this is something that we see in Clovis dig sites and Clovis sites where Clovis points are found is evidence of other kind of longer term habitation. Um, I'm gonna run this in the background. I'm not gonna have the sound on or anything. Uh, while I talk a little bit about where Americans come from, we already know this, we've already covered this, I know, but I think it's a good idea uh, to remind ourselves a little bit, and I'm not going to show this whole whole video, but this is a good video if you're still working on that first quiz where you're doing, uh, basically you're reproducing this map, uh, to look at if you're still working on that. And of course, this will be linked in the slides. You'll have access to the slides as soon as I upload this video, I'll also have the slides online. And what I wanna point out here, if I can get around the menu, is that coming into the Americas, uh, is, let me exit this really quickly so that I can, oh, I'm sorry, let's see, here we go. Uh, so coming into the Americas is a very late phenomenon in the migration of human beings. So here we go, we're crossing this land bridge, possibly also taking a sea bridge into the Americas for the first time, roughly 15,000 years ago. Right, roughly 15,000 years ago is the theory that we see here. And Clovis theory, the theory of Clovis point culture, roughly equates to that idea of humans showing up maybe around 15,000 years ago at, at the Bering Sea level and then down into North America, perhaps around 12 to 13,000 uh, BCE. Uh, and this is called the Clovis first theory. The Clovis first theory is an example, as I write here, and I'll, I'll go back into presenting mode now, um, is an example of how history is still changing. Even really old ancient history is still changing because of the things we find out about it, the things we are learning about that history. So um, you can watch this video if you'd like. It's a, about a 10 minute video from the Nova program on PBS. Um, and it's quite a good video. It explains some of the controversy around the Clovis first theory. So to very briefly uh, state the Clovis first theory, it says that we find Clovis points in North America bridging down from parts of Canada into the east and west of North America um, uh, in roughly 12 to 13,000 BCE onward. This is when we see them. And the Clovis first theory says that this is evidence of the first people in North America and in the Americas as a whole. These are the very first people that had ever been here. No one had been there earlier. Now, quite a few years ago now, I think about 20 years ago now, we began to find other evidence of earlier people, things like skeletons and bones and uh, a few artifacts, but not these spear points. These Clovis points remain at that roughly 13,000 BCE and newer mark, but we have evidence of people a little bit before that now. 
And there's this huge rift in archaeology that comes from this. And that's what this video will tell you about. They'll talk all about this rift, especially towards the second half of this video, in that we have a deeper layer of archaeological findings, literally a layer of things deeper in the dirt, and that's what you're seeing here, than Clovis culture. So I wanted to kind of show you this video, and you can watch it yourself. I recommend watching this video because it shows that history is evolving uh, and the archaeology is evolving in this case. Uh, and the question that I'm going to pose to you, and I'm not going to give you an answer. I have answers myself, but they're kind of my opinion, right? But uh, the question I'm going to pose to you on the discussion board is why would it matter when people arrived in the Americas? Why would you treat um, the kind of history of where people went in the world like a great race to this present day finish line? What is the purpose of that? And why would this dispute be a really big deal in history and archaeology and anthropology or paleoanthropology? Why would that be a big deal? And this video kind of answers the question, uh, admittedly, but you can also have your own opinions. Um, so here they're talking about how there are people at least 15,000 uh, years ago, uh, 15,000 BCE. So um, this is quite a change that we see. And I want you to think about this question. Why does it matter? Who cares? Okay. Uh, and that's always a question you should be thinking about when you're studying histories. It's who cares? The why does this matter question is maybe the most important question. And it's the one a historian should be able to answer to you about their research. It's, it's the one your advisors, when you're a grad student studying history, they ask you, who cares? That's the top question. Um, but to get deeper into this idea, to kind of dive in, we have America as a counterpoint. Um, for a very long time, and this is what the book describes, uh, for a very long time, the Americas were seen as a place that lagged quite far behind Africa and Eurasia in terms of human development, in terms of the civilization that developed. And this seems like a natural conclusion based on the maps we've been looking at of people migrating across the continents, right? Because as you see, the very last place, major continental place people arrive, they arrive at some islands a little bit later, is the Americas. So you might naturally guess that in the Americas, people would be automatically kind of far behind the rest of the world. Something like the Bronze Age would start much later in the Americas. Or perhaps you could also, to kind of start to answer my last question, say that there's a natural reason you would see people in the Americas as more primitive than other places. And I'm not saying I believe this, but I'm saying that this is a conclusion that people did draw for a very long time. Now, the counterpoint that we see comes with Karal Supe. I believe I'm saying that correctly. I'm not 100% uh, sure about that. But this is a place that comes up in our book uh, around page 98 as the earliest site of major civilization in the Americas, major settled civilization in terms of cities, the biggest first city. Um, and I'll go ahead and start the, I'll go to the UNESCO site. You may have noticed I really like these UNESCO sites for some of these very old places because they give us a, mi a mix of maps and documents um, and a gallery, a photo gallery. You can see lots of pictures of this place. And I encourage you to take a quick look at this as you're going through the lecture slides. And they also give us these videos. Um, so I'll, I'll start playing this video in the background. Um, as the book describes, uh, Karl Supe is a fairly large urban center that was settled and at least building had begun in large scale about 2600 BCE. This is around the same time that the Great Pyramids were built, that major city-states in Babylon and, and the Cradle of Civilization were being built around the same time as some of the places like the Indus River Valley civilization were being built up. And it even predates probably most of the larger settlements in China. As we learned last time, this would be around the time of the mythical Shah dynasty, uh, actually predating it a little bit. So 
uh, while there were people in China and they had some kind of cities, they, we don't know as much about them as we do necessarily about Carl Supe. Um, and certainly you could say that the Americas in this case, in Car and this is in South America, in, in modern day Peru, I don't know if I mentioned that yet, but the book tells you that anyway. Um, this is a major civilization that is quite sophisticated. That It's certainly caught up with the rest of the world. It's not lagging behind in significant ways. So at least in some parts of the Americas, we see civilizations that mirror or match those of uh, Africa and Eurasia. And I won't watch this whole video with you, but this is, it has a narration and everything. You can watch that video on your own if you'd like. Um, and this is an image here of Karal Supe. This is, you'll see this image quite regularly when you're looking into this place. And Karl Supe is not an isolated phenomenon. It's quite clear that this city is part of a network or kind of hotbed of development. And as you see, it is along a river or series of rivers here uh, that flows from Peru out into the ocean. And there again, we see we have essentially a river valley civilization. So once again, you know, just like we had uh, the river valley civilizations in China, in India, in Africa, and in the Middle East, we have another one here in Peru. Um, and you could say a couple of them actually uh, in the Americas. So the Andes, this mountain range that we're talking about here, is really a, a place that predates our earlier understandings of when agriculture and long-term large-scale human settlement showed up in the Americas. So the discovery and research into Corral Supe upends this idea of the Americans lagging behind. Um, and as we know from Africa and Eurasia, agriculture leads to urbanization. When you start growing crops, you start having that excess of food like we've already talked about in other lectures, you start having enough calories and enough, enough material resources to support people doing lots of other things besides just growing or, or catching food. So we see a series of at least 18 major city-like uh, areas in the Kural region. You can call this broadly the Kural civilization. And we also see a little bit later, around 2000 BCE, maybe 500 to 600 years after Kural Supe, another uh, set of settlement, settlements uh, around present day Lima, called uh, El Paraiso. I'm sorry for my Spanish. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Japanese speaker, so I, I don't speak other languages besides Japanese. Everything comes out sounding like Japanese. Uh, when I try to say it, but um, this is certainly a very important set of uh, civilizations or one broader civilization that we can look at. And this is definitely a big deal because of that. So I've kind of answered these questions down on the bottom left already, at least a little bit. Well, let's continue looking at them a little bit more. Um, at Karal Supe, they found at least one very old Kwipu, uh, which is this a very old kind of a record keeping system or writing system. And it was still in use by the Incas uh, who hit their peak in the modern period, you know, in the, in the common era, 1400 to 1500 CE, which to me is kind of like the modern period as a pre-modernist. Uh, the modern period generally starts between 1400 and 1600, depending on where you are, that's early modern. So the Incas, we're still using the Kwipu, uh, you know, several thousand, the 3,500 to 4,000 years later after Karal Supe, and they've found these Kwipu uh, in Karal Supe, at, le at least one. I think they found more than one, but I know they found at least one, as the book tells you. And we don't know how to read these. So once again, we have another language, and we'll have yet another one today, that existed and is significant but we don't really know what they're saying. So this is kind of like the Indus River Valley civilization, another unknown language that people are trying to figure out. There seems to be significance in that uh, what you have is a central line with lots of strings or braids coming off of it. There seems to be a significance in the placement of knots and the size of knots 
on these uh, on these braids of, of rope or twine, whatever you'd call it, coming off of the central line. And their position relative to each other, if one is further down than another, that seems to make a difference. But we don't quite know how to read this. It seems to be, at least the guess at this point, the common guess, is that this is some kind of record keeping system used perhaps to regulate things like trade. Um, maybe not something used to write complex concepts like law or uh, religious text on. This is probably something more like record keeping for trade. That seems to be, and once again, we don't know, that seems to be probably what Kwipu are used for. Um, and, and people still do work with Kwipu today, but we don't have a good sense of how to understand what this Kwipu says from 4,000 years ago without any context. Um, something the book talks about that I think is very significant, and this is a picture straight from the book, I think it's on page 104, it might be on 105, um, is the difference in animal availability. And this is something that people long thought explained this lag, the, this theoretical lag between the Americas and other places. And it may explain that lag in other parts of the Americas, perhaps parts of North America, where there is certainly some lag between the development of major cities um, and, and permanent agriculture and, you know, compared to what you see in other societies, including uh, Karal Supe. So some parts of the Americas are behind other parts of the Americas and the rest of the world in developing, you know, large scale uh, urbanized civilization. And one reason that they think this is that uh, this might be is because of difference in animal availability. So here we can see in red or this very dark uh, orange color, this is what's available in Asia. So Asia has probably the most animal abundance. And here by Asia, they also mean the Middle East. Um, certainly. Um, and then in Africa, you have the donkey. Uh, and as we know, Africa was trading for things like water buffalo, probably about, you know, 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, they were certainly trading for things like water buffalo, domesticated versions, um, and, and goats and things like that. Uh, in North America, the only thing we have is the turkey. Uh, until much more close to the modern age, things like horses, uh, those are brought over from Europe. Um, and so the only native species that is domesticated is the turkey, which is much, much later. This is, uh, you know, in the first millennia uh, BCE. And then in South America, we have the llama and alpaca, uh, probably around 6,000 years ago. So these are present at the time of Kural Supe um, and other civilizations in uh, South and Mesoamerica. Um, uh, most, I, I should say, just, just say South America, not Mesoamerica. Um, so as a result of this, one thing we see is that fishing may have started out earlier in the Americas than elsewhere. If you remember uh, back to when we were studying Mesopotamia, they weren't really fishing very much. It was probably because you know, fishing is complicated. Um, it's not as easy as herding animals and it's not as reliable as herding animals. Uh, so if, if you can get a thousand goats together, there's no reason to go fish, uh, especially because fishing, you know, you're not necessarily going to get anything that day. Probably some people were eating some things out of the water, but fishing on a large scale is not apparent in Mesopotamia until much, much later. Uh, whereas in the Americas, it's, it's visible pretty early on. There's also, uh, quite an abundance of high yield crops that you don't really have to have animals to grow very well. So things like grains, things like rice and wheat, barley, um, and later corn, uh, really do require or are helped quite a lot by the presence of draft animals. That is to say, animals that can pull a plow for you and help you till the earth and get your crops planted. Doing all of that work by hand or by shovel is much, much more time consuming and much, much more calorie intensive than doing it with a plow and a plow animal, uh, something like a cow or a, a water buffalo, a yak, etc. Pulling a uh, plow is very good for you. 
the presence of things like pumpkins and squash and sweet potatoes means that people, especially in South America and Central America, don't need to work as hard to farm uh, because pumpkins and squash and sweet potatoes, they're calorically dense and you don't need to work the land as much to grow them, not as much as with grains. And then we have staples like corn and, and see book see the book page 108 on corn. The corn originates in southern Mexico um, and it's from around 4,000, 5,000 BC it shows up, but it's not really being grown as intensively in the Americas right away as, as other grains are in other parts of the world. We do have beans and quinoa also showing up, but without these draft animals, without plows, it's much more difficult to grow them in mass quantities. And by comparison, uh, we have uh, evidence that these animals were in use in Mesopotamia, and I have a link here for you, um, by 3000 BCE. Uh, so Mesopotamia had these animals early, so did China, so did India. Uh, as you know, the cow, as you probably know, the cow is sacred in India, um, and this is a very old concept. Um, Let's look at another set of sites in uh, Chavin de Huantar. Once again, I hope I'm not butchering that too badly. But uh, about 500 years later, after the Kral sites, um, and these are the sites around Lima, these Chavin sites, um, we see a broader network emerge that uh, is called Chavin culture. This is one of the ruins of Chavin uh, culture at Chavin de Huantar. Um, and our book has a map of this, what they call the Chavin cultural zone. So they're pre-Chavin sites, early Chavin sites, Chavin sites, etc. And importantly, we see these trade routes. So one of the features of Chavin and possibly Supe, Carl Supe culture is the presence of roads that connect multiple settlements. They're pretty high quality roads. These are leveled off, planed off, often with retaining walls, maybe even a kind of guardrail like uh, built up uh, sets of rocks or other packed earth, etc. Because this is a very mountainous area, you do need to do a lot of work to get roads functioning. And one of the animals, if we go back, that they do have in South America, and, and the signature animal, perhaps, of, of much of South America, is the llama, especially of Peru. Um, and llamas are excellent at going up and down mountains and, and taking mountain roads. I have my friend the llama here with his wonderful sunglasses. Um, and uh, this is just one example of kind of working with what you have. The people of this Chavin uh, culture, they work with what they have, they build roads, and they use llamas as pack animals uh, to carry heavy loads across these mountain passes or through these mountain passes along these mountain roads and to and from different areas uh, in their quote unquote cultural zone. Now, this is something the Incas, much later, thousands of years later, are also known for. There's an extensive set of road systems. The Incas in particular are known for their rope bridges, which have to be rebuilt and, and fortified every few years, uh, which cross through across valleys in, in these mountain ranges in the Andes. And uh, so this network of roads, which is later uh, really capitalized on by the Incas seems to be as old as, you know, about 4,000 years old, at least. And so once again, we're kind of pushing back on this theory of the Americas as lagging behind here. I think that's fair to say. Um, a material culture note here. I'm going, I'm going to wrap this up fairly quickly because I want today to be quick, but so I am moving kind of quickly. Um, but, uh, this is a question I would ask all of you, and I'll answer it for you pretty much immediately. But why did American, or why did European explorers of the Americas uh, become fixated on Latin America? Um, and the answer is gold, right? One of the big things that attracted uh, explorers and conquerors, conquistadors, etc., to the Americas, especially Central and South America, was the presence of lots of gold artifacts. 
uh, and objects that uh, people were using for ritual, for decoration, wearing on their bodies, wearing on headdresses and as jewelry. Um, and so it was the Chauvin civilization or Chauvin culture that seems to have really gotten metallurgy going in terms of turning gold into very fine objects, very small, intricate objects. Um, and here's one example from the Met of one of these objects that is, you know, kind of stolen away from Peru. Uh, it's a pre-Inca object uh, that was stolen away uh, back in the 1920s. Um, purchased there and brought into uh, the United States. This happens with objects from all around the world, and this is a very controversial element of museum culture, is that a lot of museums, particularly in England, uh, house a lot of objects that are seen as kind of stolen artifacts. Um, and here's one example uh, from Peru. Uh, this is a very old earring, it seems to be, an ear decoration made of gold. Um, and you can click this here to, to read this and, and look at other objects in the Met um, that are uh, housed from Chauvin culture. So this is theorized to have come from Chauvin culture. It's, it's kind of uh, authenticity is not known, but that is the story that comes with this object. And it seems to be that kind of object just based on looking at it and what uh, archaeologists think of it uh, is it seems to be a Chauvin gold earpiece. Um, moving into Mesoamerica, so Mesoamerica, Central America, um, you may be familiar with the Mayans and Aztecs to some degree. This is their home range, although the Aztecs and Mayans are both quite a bit later. Um, although, although the Mayans are actually a bit earlier than this graphic states here, we will uh, maybe talk about them a little bit before we get to the American conquests by Europeans, but we'll certainly be talking about Mesoamerica again uh, once we get to things like the conquistadors. But the very first group of people that seem to be active in Mesoamerica on a large scale are the Olmecs. Uh, they're, you see them here around La Venta. Um, and they're another interesting group that has another interesting writing system, kind of uh, similar to both Chinese and hieroglyphics in that it's an ideo or ideographic um, writing system wherein certain words are represented by the things they look like. So to say fish, and I don't know if fish is actually a real example here, but to say fish, you would draw something, a character that looks sort of like a fish, but over time morphs into something else that maybe doesn't look like a fish, but it means fish. That's what, that's how pictographic uh, languages shift to ideographic languages. And Olmec is somewhere in there between pictographic, which means you're just basically drawing the picture of something to represent it, and ideographic or ideographic, meaning it is changed slightly to uh, represent something that it no longer looks like. Um, but you can learn about the Olmec writing system. It's kind of been partially deciphered. We seem to know, and I, I am obviously no expert in Olmec, uh, but we seem to know some of what they were writing, but not all of it. There are some partial uh, artifacts that have, it's, it's kind of like a part of a Rosetta Stone, but it's not complete. We have some of that. And I've seen percentages on how much Olmec we know. I'm, I'm not an expert, but it's somewhere between 30 and 50%, it seems, that we can read accurately. And there's a whole paper, a whole scholarly paper here that was presented at a conference, um, which talks a little bit about uh, translating or attempting to translate Olmec. Um, as I said later, in, inhabitants of Mesoamerica include the Mayans and Aztecs, but we'll get back to Mesoamerica a bit later in the term, just for now to know that the Olmecs had settled and really started to build up uh, parts of Mesoamerica with larger cities and more intricate cultures with language and uh, ritual, et cetera, by 1200 BCE uh, at the kind of furthest Point. The graphic here says 900, but 1200 to 900 seems to be a reasonable date, and that's what our textbook says. And then other Americans. Regrettably, there's only so much we can cover in this course, right? And just like the textbook uh, kind of runs through this quickly, I'm going to kind of run through this quickly, but we have a large number of other Americans 
uh, who we know generally less about than we do about even the Olmecs or especially uh, the peoples of Peru, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Incas, their predecessors, um, and uh, Carl Supe, etc. These are peoples whose really ancient history is less known. So if you're trying to get back to many thousands of years ago, you have trouble with all of these. Um, but the Inuit, who you probably have heard of, um, are also historically called the Eskimos, now known exclusively as the Inuit, really, um, expand from west to east. Um, these people essentially seem to have arrived uh, across the land bridge or, or by water into the northern reaches of what is now Alaska and Canada. And at least some of them stayed around and built a culture that retained hunter-gatherer uh, practices for the bulk of their history. This is out of necessity. Once again, working with what you have, the Inuit had essentially no ability to farm um, and had to hunt uh, to, to live. They hunted land animals to begin with. Uh, the earliest evidence from things like uh, you know, Clovis culture finds, although they weren't technically Clovis, uh, indicates this shift from hunting land mammals, things like elk, uh, to hunting whales and other animals in the water, like seals and whales. And you can look at this link if you'd like uh, for some detail on that is the rise and downfall of prehistoric Eskimos. And I don't know if you should put a ton of, uh, ton of stock into just one research paper, but this is certainly an interesting research paper that uses a DNA study of about 180, 160 prehistoric Arctic individuals, Arctic individuals to uh, examine their past. We have the Adena and Hopewell peoples often linked together. These were peoples uh, in, North America and the modern United States uh, kind of spread around the um, Midwest, I guess you'd call it, not not too far from here. Um, they had large agricultural villages, and they also have some of the earliest in North America, some of the earliest large ritual sites, which are big mounds, some of which seem to be built to worship uh, various elements of their uh, pantheon of gods or goddesses, possibly a connection to the cosmos, connection to the stars is indicated in some of these sites, and also large burial mounds. There are famously graves that have like a, a, a young child in them, maybe as a human sacrifice, but also possibly uh, a person who died early who was within a, a family of some stature, possibly a, a you know, someone who would have been chief or king. Um, the Amazonians, also extremely hard to study early on, partially because they live in this big floodplain, right? So like with some of the other cultures we've talked about where the river might have shifted on them and that might have changed their culture, we know this happens with the Amazon because the Amazon is not only a, a great gigantic river, it's also almost a network of rivers whose uh, position shifts very frequently and whose flooding probably has wiped out a lot of the archaeological evidence, which is what we would need to study the Amazonians in detail. Uh, we do have evidence in the Amazon, and this is stuff that is still being studied uh, very recently, of big canals and moats being dug. That is, what we see is essentially in this floodplain lines of water movement that are unnatural. These, these straight lines that cross natural rivers or streams that seem to be canals and moats and then are sometimes connected to archaeological finds of other uh, materials. But the Amazonians exist at least until 500 BCE as a, a separate existent culture that we just don't know that much about. And you'd have to consult with an archaeologist to learn more about them. I, I cannot help you there. Uh, the Caribbean islands. Um, People were there, you know, 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BCE or thereabouts. People were there and were existing as uh, first as hunter-gatherers, but agriculture seems to have arrived fairly late. 
There are distinct cultures across the Caribbean from 500 to 500, so 500 BCE to 500 CE, a thousand year period. Um, and I just do not know that much about them. The book does not tell you very much about them. And I don't want to make assumptions about them, but we do know that agriculture was a late arrival to the Caribbean, as it was generally to islands. And we see a similar story in Oceania and Polynesia. I'll refer you again to the book for those cultures, which it talks about for a few pages. Um, once again, of note is that the, uh, the putting it all together, which I believe starts at the very end of page 115, is a very good part of the book to read closely. It's about a page long. It's really not much of a read. Um, it doesn't take long to read through. And I would like you to take a close look at that because it will help summarize a lot of this disparate information. Um, so next time we'll zoom out for some more global comparisons. Um, we're going to uh, kind of jump around a bit more. We'll look a little bit. Uh, I, I think I'd like to talk just briefly about Stone Age Europe to maybe look at something like Stonehenge very briefly. Um, and then also look at uh, some of the areas to fill in some gaps here uh, before we begin talking uh, in both our discussions and in class about the differences and similarities that we see across all of these cultures that we've studied so far. And we might also look very quickly at some of the ruins of the early Mayan empire uh, as we start to get closer and closer to uh, the end of the BCE, the end of the ancient ancient or, or prehistory and into uh, just the pre-modern and uh, later ancient periods of global history. Okay, so I'm going to stop here for now and we'll be talking on the discussion board over the next uh, week or so about some of the readings we've done up to this point and especially today's reading. For next time, please read chapter 6, page 122 to 140, and I will have a lecture for you on that. I'm going to try to get that up by Thursday or Friday at the latest. And we're running right along on course here for our, uh, our plan as it's laid out in the syllabus. Okay. Uh, I hope all of you are happy and healthy out there and escaping the coronavirus uh, as best you can. Please let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you next time.